Hey guys, welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Uh, usual rules apply, comment anything you want below this video and I'll get back to you in next week's video. Before I get on to last week's comments, uh, house admin. So yesterday, I mentioned in last week's video that yesterday was a charity event doing the uh, attempting to break the world record for the most back-to-back -back DJs. Uh, we smashed it, apparently 180 something, I haven't got the figures in front of me, 147 was the one to beat and we got 180 or something like that. Um, but yeah, smashed it, got the world record, so that's brilliant. Well done to all the guys who uh, organised that whole event. Uh, a mate of mine, Dan, uh, and of course Joshua Brooks' venue. Um, yeah, so Congratulations to everyone involved there. Brilliant event um, and made it onto BBC News as well, which is pretty cool. Um, other than that, I don't think there's anything major to mention. Uh, no, nothing imminent coming up at the moment. No, so straight on to last week's comments, starting at the top. We've got Cavoke, uh, cheers Dom, Opal, high five. Uh, still in house move chaos, so just a quick question idea. Have you considered straw bale construction for the studio? Cheap as chips and amazing thermal and acoustic insulation properties. Saw it on Grand Designs many moons ago and investigated further for a project that never happened. Uh, it's basically timber frame with straw bales sealed uh, waterproof between the frames. Uh, P.S. I'm another one who found you via Bitwig tutorials, though I had been a Zeton customer back in the day. Cheers. Uh, yes, I have looked at the straw bale stuff and it's awesome, but I think, I, in fairness, I haven't looked at it for this build, but I'm fairly sure that it's going to be inappropriate for this build only because I'm not looking to build so my last place was virtually soundproofed which is very different to acoustically treated um, and that was in an industrial unit so I could get away with using huge products and whatever and it was fine uh, this I'm doing in the back garden and I'm I, I mean I've never worked particularly loud anyway so I'm not too bothered on acoustic insulation in terms of soundproofing um, I'm well what takes a higher priority than that is depth of walls because I've got quite a limited space it's not a big garden um, and in fact there's already like a garden shed at the bottom of the garden which I'll be replacing and that's already on a sort of concrete foundation of sorts and that's what I'm going to be extending and building on. So I'm going to be quite limited in space and the straw bell construction stuff, uh, as good as it, as it is, um, I think it's probably too thick and it's just going to use up too much space. And I'm, I'm really not going to be left with any space inside then, uh, unfortunately. But now you've mentioned it, I will look into it just in case you can get different depths or something. But I think I've probably sort of the way I've planned it out at the moment is using SIPS panels um, and I think that's probably about as cheap as you can get in the bang for buck kind of insulation versus price war um, but cheers anyway and I think I actually saw that grand designs and I'm pretty sure that's how I knew about the uh, the material in the first place I'm sure it was grand designs great program um, Daddy Custard, I second Sunset 86's Love of Opal Fruits. Uh, we haven't got there yet, but these comments are obviously backwards a bit, but whatever. Uh, Opal Fruits, yes, I love them, uh, and therefore high five. Uh, remember Toffos, yes, I do. Uh, wonder if they're still around. I I haven't seen them, but I haven't looked for them either. Uh, anyway, I have a question about phase. I understand generally in principle what it is, especially when recording the same thing via two different sources and how that might cause issues. But is this something that we really need to be concerned within the elect electronic music world? If so, are there particular areas to look out for? Drums, bass, etc. Yes, yes and yes. 
so yeah you're right phasing is is an issue definitely if you're recording so if for example you're recording a live drum kit you've got five maybe six even seven mics on the kit uh, potentially even more but you'll have for example a dedicated kick drum mic pretty much a dedicated uh, crash area or ride area mic um, you'll have one for hi-hat snare um, if not one for each and then you'll have things like ambience and room mics above overheads and stuff like that um, depending on the room you're in obviously um, so obviously with those microphones they're all you know if a sound wave travels from a kick drum to the kick mic and then it travels a bit further and it hits say the ambience mic or the overhead mic if those things aren't perfectly in phase so whatever frequency the kick drum is let's say i don't know say 100 hertz or whatever and um, I, I can't remember the physical length of a 100 hertz wave, but it's probably, you know, a metre or so, a couple of metres long. If that, if those two mics aren't in the same distance within the wave shape, then when they get played back later on together, one cancels the other out and then you get phasing or well, not cancels completely, but you'll have phasing issues because the waves are sort of off each other and they'll be cutting elements out. So that's essentially what phasing is. <clears throat> um, so yes, you're absolutely right. When you're recording one source with multiple mics, um, then you, you're prone to phasing issues. Um, however, if you look into studying something like DSP, which is digital signal processing, which is basically everything we do, um, then things like filters, um, there are, hundreds of different types of filters whether they be Butterworth filters or whatever um, and each one of those by definition the mathematics of a filter uh, causes points of resonance which is why they call it Q factor because the Q is in the equation for a filter um, and by definition of any filter depending on what kind of filter whether it be I think you get polynomials and binomials and all sorts of different ones. Um, you're you're going to get some sort of um, essentially latency at certain frequencies, and we're talking microscopic bits of latencies. Obviously, to to everyone, you know, we we use filters every day, say a, a low pass filter, and if you sweep through that frequency, um, what you're actually doing. If you were to pass a perfect sine wave or a perfect square wave or whatever through um, a low pass filter, as you filter out, there are going to be at different cutoff points through the filter, um, there are going to be slightly different latency delays in how that wave or how that frequency gets treated and processed. Um, so, actually, you know, with things like reverb and filters, uh, you get um, phasing issues that can occur when a stereo signal has a slightly different frequency value on the left or the right channel and that's when you can start getting phasing issues so it's not it's not something you're going to come across every day if you're dealing with mono signals it's probably not much of an issue if you're dealing with stereo signals which is why I mentioned reverb because that tends to add a, a specific delay to left or right um, then using filters can cause phase now you do get I think waves off a um, uh, I forget what they call it a, a linear phase EQ or something like that which basically means that it treats left and right by equal values depending on inputs and whatever again I've not studied that necessarily so I don't I don't know the ins and outs of it. So, there, but what I'm saying is there are certain types of filters that are perhaps better than others at treating phase issues and things like that. Then on top of that, after I've waffled on for ages, I will also add the caveat of don't worry too much because 
it's pretty rare in electronic music it's it's pretty rare that this happens anyway and 99% of the time when it does happen it's really not a problem anyway um, it's pretty rare that it'll happen uh, the only thing I would say is if you are a bit paranoid about these things just flick your speakers onto mono or your master out into mono um, and just double check that nothing sounds weird and you'll you'll know what it sounds it sounds like a phaser basically or a slight distorted phaser um, you know and you might hear it in your kick drums or something or your snares or s vocals something along those lines um, you know you, you'll just hear a slight saturated ugliness to it and it just sounds almost wonky in particular frequencies um, so in terms of uh, the principle of phase that's kind of it I suppose in terms of whether it's something you should be concerned about it's something I think people should be aware of but I don't think it's something that as electronic music producers we don't really need to be worried about it too much um, and then of course if you're getting your music professionally mixed and mastered then really that's when you know someone's trained to listen out for phasing issues so uh, if you're getting a professional mix engineer or mastering engineer then that's not too much of an issue I can just hear my doorbell so back in a second sorry about that uh, where was I that was longer than expected uh, Right, we were talking about phase, I think. Um, I think I pretty much answered it. Uh, so, next, Fin Fighter, Opal, high five. Thanks for doing these AMA vlogs. They are very nice to watch on Fridays. You're welcome. Uh, Sunset86, hey Dom, uh, I love Opal Fruits. That's Starburst to the Millennials. Yes, it is. Uh, wow, that's nearly 50 AMAs. I've watched all of them, I think. Uh, thanks for answering the question about mixing with effects on, etc. Uh, that was really helpful. I have another mixing question to keep the video going longer. Part one. So, I know you've touched upon gain staging, headroom, etc. in previous videos, having mentioned about keeping tracks at minus 10 for exporting to stems, etc. What is the ideal number to aim for when recording, especially external hardware? Uh, I mean, should you just record at minus 10 at source if using hardware, or is it okay to record at, say, minus 18 and just bring it down pre-fader or will that have any effect on the definition or quality? Uh, before I keep reading, so uh, in terms of the digital side with your workstation, it makes no difference. It could be minus one dB, it could be minus 50 dB. The quality on a good workstation with a good interface really won't, you know, it's not gonna, it's not gonna change anything. The question really is about the hardware that you're recording. And the signal to noise ratio on that uh, there are certain bits of hardware you can't quite see behind me in fact I think some of it's on the floor um, so things like I've got an SPL vitalizer that I always found a little bit noisy um, so you needed to always kind of push quite a hot signal into that to then record back in terms of signal coming out from hardware so let's say the sub 37 for example um, coming into Bitwig it really doesn't matter. Um, I tend to have my gain set at my my gain set at minus ten, but that's post input anyway. Um, and then I'll record it as hot or cold as I want. Really, I don't don't really think about it too much, so long as it's not slamming into the red or you know, near invisible, doesn't really matter um, because I know the signal to noise ratio, the, the sub 37 and what I mean by that is is it's not a noisy device, it's not hissy or anything like that. Um, i give you an opposite example, the camera you're watching me on right now, the built-in microphone is horrendous, which is fine, I'm, I'm not slagging it off, it's a DSLR camera so you'd never expect it to have a great built-in microphone. Uh, but the camera I'm use the microphone I'm using, which is attached to it, is a Rode VideoMic Pro, uh, which is a great shotgun mic, um, and it is genuinely a superb microphone. However, you will notice there is a little bit of hiss in the videos that I upload, and the reason for that 
is because the encoder in the camera is also shockingly bad. So what I've had to do, uh, and this is a tip for anyone that records video using DSLR cameras, is I've had to turn the internal gain of the audio right down. I think it's on notch one or two out of however many there are. Um, and I've boosted the microphone by 20 dB, which is why I use the Rode VideoMic Pro, because it has a plus 20 dB boost. So, uh, and even then, it's still the, the end recording is a little bit quiet and I have to boost a little bit more. And that little bit of hiss you hear in the background of these videos uh, is coming from the internal camera processing. Uh, it's just not a particularly good one. And I know that I could record the audio separately and send it to a dedicated recorder like perhaps the expensive audio interface and equipment I have here, but I'm just too lazy, so deal with it. Um, so my point is, is that if you have hiss at any point in the chain, you want to try and drown that out. So if, for example, the Moog had some sort of analog based hiss that was set at, you know, creeping in at say minus 40 dB, which is virtually inaudible in any workstation, then you would need your, your signal to be well over minus 40 dB so that it's drowning out that hiss. Um, I have done some mix jobs for people in the past where they've used an old analog synth um, and they've obviously recorded the signal in quite low and what you end up with is a fair bit of hiss so then when you're bringing all the levels up and especially if you're passing it through you know dynamic compressors and things like that then you know you're expanding that hiss you're bringing that hiss out um, which means you'll notice sometimes in in tracks uh, i know i've done some mixes where um, they've recorded that i'll call it a moog whatever synth they've recorded that channel all the way throughout the track and of course when it's not playing it's just there's hiss there and if you've got a compressor running on that channel it's going to be boosting that hiss so as a mix engineer those again are the kinds of things that you look for um, to bring them out and then you can either add a gate to it or uh, you can manually cut the hiss out in, in most circumstances it's not a major big deal to deal with but again then when if you if you're dealing with say 10 15 20 different microphone inputs from like the drum kit I was on about earlier, then it becomes a bit of a logistical nightmare, which is why people use gates and blah, 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 blah. Um, so in terms of recording, um, uh, to be honest, I don't know if there's a specific number I'd recommend. I, I guess you, the advice really is go by feeling. Obviously you don't want it clipping and saturating, but there's no real magic one number. I think each piece of hardware will have its own magic number. Uh, the only thing you've got to be careful of is A, you don't run it too hot because it'll saturate or clip or whatever. Um, and then on the flip side of that, you don't want to run it too cold because if there is any hiss or any hum or buzz or electric interference or anything like that, which you can get in, in any hardware really, um, then you want the signal to at least drown that out. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, I know it's digital whatnot, but would it not be easier to just record at minus 10 for hardware? Um, so the other thing to look out for is this is why uh, if any of you have not heard of or if you have heard of KMS 20 metering, uh, in fact it's something Bitwig offer by default, uh, with the KMS 20 metering, um, that's basically it's where we're used to having uh, 0 dB in the digital world is your where it starts to clip above zero dB. Um, I think the equivalent to that is minus 20 dB in the analog world, um, uh, or the inverse of that, I suppose. So zero dB in the digital world is minus 20 in the analog world um, because you want to run things a bit hotter or less. And the reason for that is because when you're sending a signal out um, from a workstation, Traditionally, analog signals uh, got a lot hotter a lot quicker. They couldn't cope with what we call zero dB. We'd just smash through uh, an old analog compressor. So you'd have to lower it to minus 20 dB, send the signal out to the analog compressor, and then back in. And then if you need to raise it by 20 dB, do so. Um, so 
that's really why the KMS20 uh, metering system exists. Um, so again, that's something that you can work with and look into if you're recording a lot of hardware. Uh, part two, also with regard to mixing, do you make panning decisions for clients or do they need to communicate with you? Uh, thanks as always, Dom, 50 AMA is nearly in. It's been a good journey. These AMAs give me something to look forward to on a Friday. Have a great weekend. You too, thanks. Um, panning decisions. <laughs> A lot of it depends on the recording, so I think it's one of those things where, as a mix engineer, it's not necessarily my job to make panning decisions for the artist because they might not agree and they might not want anything panned anywhere. If they've made the panning decision beforehand, let's say, for example, they've panned hats slightly to the right, then that's all well and good. If they've panned too far to the right, then I'll dial it back a bit to the left. Um, because if it just doesn't work in mono or if it causes an issue somewhere or if I just think it's way too far to the right, then I'll dial it back a bit if I think they're not going for that stylistically. Um, however, if they've left hats in the centre, I'll usually leave them in the centre unless I find myself panning or unless maybe there's something over in the left and I think actually if I move these hats to the right it's freeing up a bit of room so that's really when I'd usually make that decision otherwise if it's an acoustic recording or a rock track or uh, you know if it's a real drum kit or something then generally I'll pan uh, according to where the drum kit is to the listener and the same with orchestral stuff you know um, you start with the 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 bassier things or start with the higher range things on uh, on the left and then move to the bassier on the right so your cellos and whatever are on the right and your your violins and violas are on the left and uh, the reason for that is traditionally because if you go to an uh, a theater and watch an orchestra play then that's generally how they'll appear to you at, when you're watching the orchestra you'll have your your tubers and your cellos over on the right and you'll have your violins and your your alto sax or whatever it is on on the left and that's generally how it pans out so as a mix engineer you kind of make those decisions and it, so if I feel that someone's going for that orchestra effect then um, or if it's a an actual orchestra recording then I'll tend to make those panning decisions if they haven't already been done um, so yeah so it's kind of a yes sometimes but not always um, hopefully that makes sense uh, St Nicholas congratulations on 50 AMAs we're not there yet this is number 49 I think um, but thank you in advance uh, it's greatly appreciated here's to the next 50 definitely uh, that graphic EQ behind your left shoulder is rare and sought after Opal god bless High five. Uh, yes, the uh, graphic EQ is the Samsung D400, uh, 1400, can't remember. Um, yeah, it was one of those ones that um, I think they only sold for a limited time. I don't know why, because it seems to be well sought after and I've had a lot of people contact me offering me money for my EQ. Um, it's not for sale, um, so yeah, there we go. Um, but it is very handy. It's just one of those things that's, you know, it, it does a lot more than just give you a graphic EQ. It actually does room testing and um, it can auto EQ mixers and stuff like that. But I don't use any of those features. For me, it is literally just a graphic in front of me. Um, and when I build the studio, I'm hopefully going to sort out a proper desk and I will have it front and centre um, because it is one of those things that's just really handy to see if your waves are, are spiking at 50 hertz or whatever. Um, yes, there we go. Zombo, what is this whole Atmos Dolby 5.1? I don't know what it is. Uh, so the so surround sound, I think we all know you've got your, your, your left and right normal two stereo recording uh, you've got 2.1 when you add a subwoofer. Uh, you've then got uh, 5.1 when, 
would be your standard, what we call standard surround sound. So you'd have got um, front left, front right, rear left, rear right, subwoofer is the, the point one, and then one front and center. So your mono signals, your center signals come through the, the center speaker. So things like voices and whatever, and then music and ambience can be moved around. Dolby Atmos is, um, I've, I've not, I'm not in any way, shape or form an expert. I'm not an expert in many things, but particularly surround. Um, to my understanding, Dolby Atmos is essentially anything more than 7.1. Um, but obviously it's, it's built by Dolby and usually installed by Dolby engineers and, uh, and not a, an easy thing to do, but it, it works using, I guess, speaker array technologies. Um, so where you, with an array, uh, you might notice, uh, when you go to a big event and have, I don't know if you've ever noticed on the sides of stages where you have those massive speaker systems and there's one missing I don't know if you've ever noticed that you might get seven or nine speakers dangling from the ceiling in a huge arena and there's always one missing or maybe two missing and you always sort of look at it and go why is that missing the reason that's missing is because it's called an array and it's using the laws of physics to work out um, if you were to add that one whole speaker in then actually it becomes quieter because they're fighting against each other. So they're staggered out in a particular pattern called an array and it adds to the the volume of air movement, I suppose. Um, so Dolby Atmos kind of takes that a step further by having an array of speakers around your room, which then allows you to have essentially 360 or spherical, almost uh, semi-spherical surround sound. Um, so that's the idea. Uh, it's a system I would love to be able to play with or to work with, um, but it's not one that's quite likely to happen in in my career, to be honest. Um, so yeah, there, that's what it is. Oh, can we get Kindred on live streams uh, in the future? He was live on Twitch and I asked him and he said yes to be on your podcast. Oh, there we go. Uh, well, that would be cool. Um, live streams is something I'm going to look into at some point. Um, especially for these AMAs, I think they could be live, which would be quite cool because then you can actually respond to me as I'm answering questions as well. So it might might be a good thing. Don't know. Um, but yeah, definitely for the podcast thing, I am very close to getting that set up. I've started speaking to certain producers. Uh, the biggest issue is going to be geography, I think. Um, because I need to be in the room with that person and uh, whether it be me in their studio or theirs, you know, them in mine. Um, so obviously the first bunch of these podcast things I'm going to do are going to be um, more local, I suppose. Um, but that's not to say that I might organise some trips away at some point um, if I can tie them in. Or hopefully, I mean, I'm in Manchester, it's centre of the universe for music, so uh, hopefully a lot of cool artists are going to be coming this way and uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, can we also get a podcast with Black Gummy? That guy is so mysterious. Uh, is he? Um, yeah, well, I mean, again, Black Gummy would be a good one. Uh, so yeah, high five for all of those. Uh, Reality on X production, shoot that world record thing as a vlog. Damn it, too late. Uh, I did actually think about doing that, but it was so noisy and chaotic. And I was one of the early DJs because I, I sort of planned it and said to him that I'm absolutely going to do it and help you out. And that's great. Um, but uh, I was one of the early ones, so I wasn't there for the peak, um, which is a shame because I'd have loved to have afforded the time to be able to stay longer. But um uh, unfortunately that wasn't going to be the case I had other things to do so uh, yeah I did I did think about vlogging it but actually as it turned out I'm not sure it would have been a particularly good vlog um, however it was on uh, the news last night so they kind of vlogged it for me um, 
Dead Mouse Cinco, the Mexican Dead Mouse. Hi Dom, Opal, high five. Wow, really close to 50 AMAs. Maybe you can make a little special or something similar. Uh, I don't really have any questions. I just want to say that I'm going to buy a new PC very soon. Uh, one and a half to two months and it's mainly built for music production but it also can be used for anything else really can't wait big hype high five for your new pc uh, that's always exciting uh, and then it's a few more high fives coming to janice Lockmelis or yanis Lockmelis. opal high five bwo official opal high five and chi opal high five uh, that my friends is it for this week i feel like i've rushed it but Whatever, I've got stuff to do. Um, yeah, thank you very much for watching this week. It is number 49. So next week is the 50th AMA. So please do uh, give us all your questions. Ask me anything you want. Uh, in fact, go left field and go out there and ask a weird question if you want for number 50. Let's do something. Um, I have been sort of trying to think of, is there something I can do to make it special? And I don't know because actually it's you guys that control the content so I suppose it's at this point I want to say thank you to everyone who has followed this AMA and especially to those guys who've watched this every week um, you know to, that, that's a year solid of every week that, that you guys have been asking questions um, and like I say it, it is thanks to you guys asking the questions that I'm actually able to do this because if nobody asks anything it's not going to be much of a, a video so uh, uh, the real thanks goes to you guys for watching this and subscribing and sharing and liking and doing what you do best. Um, yeah, so uh, thanks for that. Uh, if you've made it this far into this uh, week's AMA, then again, you deserve a medal. And to prove you have done so, uh, I would say comment the word music. Pretty easy. I'll see you next week. Cheers.